<coughs> okay. So this is something I've done with Axel and uh, some project is going on with David Moss in Manchester and Reza in London. Uh, the idea is to use uh, pencil code for simulation in spherical polar coordinate system. And the way it is done is basically it can be adapted to any non-Cartesian coordinate system also. Um, if it is orthogonal, then it will very straight, it will be very straightforward. For non-orthogonal systems, I am not very sure how to do it yet. So let us we'll first talk about the differential operators and how to adapt coding the differential operators of the non-Cartesian coordinate systems in the pencil code. Then we will talk about the changes that are needed to be done to the boundary conditions. Uh, little changes on the way quantities are being averaged. And then we will talk about performance and some preliminary results. This code is somewhat complementary to Marcus's talk. Marcus showed you the result, I am going to show you the skeleton. So the easiest operator to consider is the gradient of a scalar. So let's look at the gradient of a scalar in spherical polar <coughs> coordinate system. You see that this one is basically unchanged. And then there is a 1 over r factor in the theta derivative. And then there is a 1 over r sin theta factor in the phi derivative. So the easiest way to, the first step to do rather, is to absorb this 1 over r scaling factor in this derivative and call that theta hat. Absorb this one in phi and call that phi hat. And then it's a very simple expression. So practically we can use the same derivative routine in the pencil code that calculates the derivative with little change. That I will, just, just the scaling factors need to be included. That I will, I'm going to show you later. So, sorry, there, there, sure. there is a d phi e phi hat, but there is no phi hat as such, right? Because you're not really, this is not really just e phi times the derivative. It is, just with the scaling factor. Yeah, but, but, but d f by d opening bracket r sine theta phi is not even something that is well defined, I think. Well, you can just... Can, can, can you write out the, the expression for phi hat on the, on the board? Phi hat is just phi. What do you mean by phi hat? What? I'm sorry. The so phi hat that you're oh. using there. Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about phi hat. Just worry about del del phi hat. <coughs> So yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. So that's what, that's what he means probably. I'm sure he did not worry about it. So, and therefore he said, I'm sure that it's not really, phi as such, phi hat as such, it's not really used. No, see, phi is a kind of, it doesn't have a dimension of length. So just assume you have a dimension of length included. Just think of it this way. You had a Cartesian coordinate with different scaling factors in three different directions, which were constant. If they are constant, I don't have a problem okay. with that. So till now you won't have any problem with that if they are not constant even in the Cartesian coordinate. If you just, I mean, even in the, if you only stick to the gradient of a scalar and you take only one gradient, not del square of a scalar, then this thing is perfect. Nothing wrong with that. But it's just a shorthand notation. There yes. is no phi hat and this is yes, not yes, a derivative. Just assume it's just a shorthand notation. Okay. So del del phi hat is just, is defined this way, 1 over r sin theta into this quantity. So that's very easy to think. Okay. So the more complicated situation comes when you need to take the derivative and vector. So easiest one, easiest differential operator would be divergence. So the first thing is you need to take, instead of normal derivatives, you need to take covariant derivatives. The idea is to parallel transport the vector, then take the difference, and then take the limit. So in Cartesian, um, we have this notation. We just is basically the same notation, a bit more shortened. So if you now include the scaling factors, as I did on the last slide, um, and just use this notation, then with the thing already done, you already have some part of the divergence already coded in. What happens to the other part? So the idea is the following. If you look at the definition of covariant derivative of a vector, it can be defined in the following way. So the hatted coordinates are defined in terms of the uh, unhatted coordinates with the scaling <coughs> factors. And with that coded in, you can actually take that as a new coordinate transformation. You go from phi to phi hat by multiplying by r sine theta. You go from theta to theta hat multiplying by r. And the definition of covariant derivative doesn't change. It's just the same. So idea is that you have the hatted. And then you have a new factor, a new factor which comes from the connection coefficients. 
So the idea is that the hatted are already coded, assume they are already coded in, in the scaling factor and the connection coefficient will be new terms that will be added. So now if you look, okay, so the way to take different differential operators is to take the covariant derivative, the alpha beta and, the, and contract the indices as you need. So to get divergence is just contract the two indices alpha alpha and you will get this expression. Okay. So there are some surprises in the hatted basis. So if you are working in a, for example, a spherical polar coordinate system or such non-Cartesian system, we expect the metric tensor not to be a unit tensor. But once we go over to the hatted part, it is the unit tensor. The second one is that the usual symmetry of the connection coefficients are lost. The symmetry with respect to changing the indices and stuff like that are lost. For example, gamma theta r theta is not gamma theta theta r or minus sign of that. Um, so if you notice now only these coefficients are non-zero and the rest are zero. And there are not many of them, there are just one, two, three, four, five, six of them. So to get the first covariant derivative in this coordinate system is not very complicated. What what do you mean by coordinate system? In this hat and I mean system. Well I still I still don't see where the coordinates are. I see that you've defined the derivatives, but you haven't defined coordinates. No, you can, can you write down this metric tensor? It's just one, one, one. Yeah. Okay. Can you write out the, the length element with that metric tensor on the board? Yeah, it's the R yes. hat. It's just DR yes. hat. And, and, what, squared. and what is the R hat? We know you, you no, know, R hat is unchanged. unchanged. R hat is unchanged. R hat is just. Okay, what is phi hat? Let's, or let's phi take theta hat, hat, for example. So theta hat is just R theta. Uh, so the f squared, of course, is going to be... dr squared, d theta x squared, d phi x squared. That's all right. It's just one, of course. And d phi squared. And that's equal to... No. Yes. And that's, of course, equal to... To this. And so... And this is an equal to G I J uh, D X I D X I D X I D X J So so basi so basically why there while there is no phi hat there is a, the differential. We we know we, we know the differential of phi hat which is R sine theta D phi and with that we can if we divide by it, we can do the derivatives that we started with and... Why is that with phi hat? Can't one just define phi hat as r squared sine square uh, as r sine theta phi? Because then you only... Because they are part of the I think you can. Because then the when you take the derivative, you are not changing r and sine theta because... Uh, so you think they are five the theta. Theta. Uh, I think they are thought of So they are yeah. thought of so that's fine. They're just rescaled for they each just rescaled. Value value And the scaling scale. factor changes from one part to another. That's what we need. So it has to have a length therefore. Yes. The proper correct length. Meaningful length. It's interesting, nothing wrong with that. But of course, we sh uh, that's also it's a actually a complete standard. I mean, there's nothing that we have invented. It's, uh, it's of course, something what Riemann and people like this, of course, knew and Einstein. But the uh, habit business is not so frequently used. Right. But of course, if you go to Misna San Vila, it's all in there. There's nothing, nothing new. Not really in very simple language. So, you unhappy, happy? Stunned. <laughs> <laughs> go on, uh, it's probably. Uh, it's used a lot in black hole theory, by the way. In black holes, uh, in numerical relativity, you can always use that. Okay, so the curl would be just the standard epsilon and the covariant derivative. Now, the whole thing is very simple. You just need to be a bit careful when you take the higher order derivatives. <coughs> Nothing complicated either. So when we typically take derivatives, say for example alpha and the two derivatives are beta and gamma, you take the inner one first and then you take the outer one, you'll get a wrong result. Because of course anything that has two indices is not a tensor. 
So this alpha comma beta is not a tensor at all. So you can't define a covariant derivative of that. So the idea to do is, is to take the outer derivative first. So you are taking the gamma derivative of a quantity which is a second rank tensor. So it transforms with two connection coefficients. And then you expand each one of them. So then when you need to take third order or fourth order derivative, just expand them from the outermost derivative, not the innermost. Okay, so let me go ahead and show you the example. So the Laplacian looks very innocent and simple in the Cartesian. Not so bad in the spherical polar coordinate either. So if you look at the expressions in standard books, uh, this will match of course all of them. Uh, the, the advantage to write it the way we are writing is that it matches very well with the way the pencil code is coded. So once we have changed the scaling factors, this quantity is something we are already getting from the code. And the rest of the quantities, which depends on the connection coefficients, are quantities that we just need to add to the code. So if you are, if you remember, of course all of you remember the code, you will observe that these quantities, these are all actually already calculated. For example, if A is velocity, then first derivative of velocity with respect, basically the uij pencil is already calculating these quantities. So you just need to combine them in the right way to get the expressions. So the first thing to do would be to go to deriv.f90, look at the uh, subroutine which actually takes the derivative, and then add a line which is something like this. If there is spherical coordinates, then just scale it by the right scaling factor. So r1 mn is just a 1 over r. And then you will of course notice that then this factors has to be introduced or defined somewhere. So a spherical coordinate, the variable itself, logical variable is defined in C data. So is 1 over R and several other quantities which are basically cot theta, sin theta and stuff like that. And then you register in the initialized modules, you calculate them and you are ready to go. So now you have everything other than the connection terms. The connection terms you add it to the file sub dot f90. Where, for example, you take the divergence. So till now, when you took the divergence of a vector of vector a, you needed a i j, the output b, but you never needed the vector itself. But now the connection coefficients will couple the derivative with the vector, as you can look back and see the vector itself is now needed. So that's another fairly simple modification. You just add this. Just leave the calculation that you have been doing untouched and just add a few new lines. <coughs> so similarly, you have to change all the derivatives that appeared there. There is gij, etc., which calculates curl, curl, and then there is del 2a, which calculates the Laplacian, and all of that stuff. So actually, there are very few changes. If you grab for else spherical, there are only 81 lines that comes out. So roughly at 81 places things have changed. Very few but very difficult changes. Yes, oh. some of them go deep. They were, they were difficult for me who was starting. Yeah. But wouldn't have been difficult for some of I mean, half the people in the room who have been living with it for five years. Yeah, there are six for example. Sorry? There are six. There are six. In six. coordinate. No, because there are six C it's even more difficult to write out the expression. See if you. Oh, sorry, you the wrong direction. Right. So you see, even the Laplacian has this many terms more. So you say one, two, three, four, five, six terms more in only the Laplacian of the R coordinate. And then you go to the sixth one, there will be many more. And one of the advantages of, say, Laplacian is there are lots of books where you will actually find the expression. So the one you get, you can compare with the books and you can be sure that you have got it right. Whereas, uh, for example, there is just two derivatives here. If there are six of them, it's complicated and hell of an expression. So at that level, it's very difficult. But at the coding level, it's not so difficult. You just have to, be, have, to have very trained fingers, which doesn't put typos. So do we have any chances of implementing fiber, fiber viscosity? 
If if I am patient enough and but not yeah, but in the end, yes, it, even in all four forty five chart, it will be so slow that we can't use it. Yes. Mm. No, it may not be very slow because see, most of the terms are actually already calculated. Oh, it's just it's just, it's just, it's just combined in the right multiplication. Okay. So not so slow because. But but, but again, I mean, the application for for on a physical fixed oil and hydrogen fusion is quite limited. If you just want it as a numerical tool, you you do it the way we did we are doing it now, and it's it's not. Going to have the isotopy ah, properties. Then, then, then you would just take the sig derivative along theta phi r. Yeah. And just it's getting yes. yes, that's true. Okay. And another comment. Yeah. I mean, already Niels Haugen, I think, was using hyper viscosity, hyper viscosity out of pencil. That means that he defined a full 3D array, calculated the del squared on that, and then, of course, calculate another that's better on that again. But are you allowed to do that? I mean, yes, but you will just need more storage. But why? I mean, I'm, I'm not allowed to do DTX and then do DTX again. Right? No, but for the second derivative, it's okay. You get exactly oh, the, the same thing. Derivative. It's just for the first derivative twice, it's not possible. Ah, okay. You can do the second derivative as many times as you want. And uh, then you get the same result. You just have to have more memory. And then you're completely independent of uh, spherical geometry. You'll just use the. Yes, but you need a lot of memory. You will need a lot more memory because to go to the sixth one, you will need to keep all the intermediate stuff. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right? No, you have to apply del square twice, mm -hmm. thrice. So you basically need two more system size arrays for each one of say U. Oh, I don't think so. I mean, no, no. you don't have intermediate. No, 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 but then how will, how will you take the next del square? You need the whole array. I mean, you, you have to find the del square operator. That's just an operator that you do. It does operate on the array once. Right. Okay, and then you do this all again. And the yes, same routine, everything the same, just new data. No, but your del square is in pencil. No, no, we are out of pencil now. We okay. moved, uh, okay. so we do this out of pencil. That's the idea. Okay. That's possible, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's so much simpler then. But then and faster, of course. Yes, but will that not spoil the cache? The cache yeah, a little bit, but uh, it, okay. it's, it's much better then, of course. And we do it for radiation, for example, and for a few other things where it's just much more convenient to be out of pencil. Yes. So there's a small comment to that. I think we should take Eurocentrism's hybrid cost to more than that and be integrated in the code. Yeah. But I think it's a good example of, of the way it should be done. Mm -hmm. And it would be, even though it's slower, much slower, it would be a good test to just if you have some results with this simplified hybrid cost, you could try it with the other one also. Yes. Do you need six thousand electricity or just four thousand electricity? Because the, as Wilkins showed, you don't need the sixth order in the Upwind scheme. The Upwind scheme is perfect with the way the sixth order is now. I mean, it's just better. Yes. The sixth order. And uh, it's not more. No, no, I mean, you don't need the sixth order covariant delivery, do you? No, that's not. You don't. If you're out of, if you're out of pencil with that calculation. Hmm. Which I think we should then. Okay. So let me go ahead. Well, may, maybe I can ask you, you mentioned yes. that, that, that the second order derivative you can do for, in a book and you can compare it. Yes. I, 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 mean, I, I seem to have heard from people using the, the spherical version of soups that there is a lot of tiny little subtle box. And one of our arms are asking this In the spherical version of, of the soups code, apparently there's a lot of subtle little box in there where there's a one of our arm missing or a scientific missing. How, how, how do you, maybe you come to that, but, but how do you really make sure that there are no such problems? No, that's, that's a difficult question. So, one of the ways to do, could be, but we, we did parts of it, was actually if you look at the magnetic module, turn off hydro, just start with some initial uh, vector potential, and turn off everything else other than resistivity. So then what you have is just the diffusion equation. And then you can solve it, and then you know the answer, and then you can compare it. So that's one way, and then you can calculate the del square in two different ways. One is to hard code the del square. Also, you can calculate del square by vector identity. For example, Carl Carl A minus gradient divergence A is del square. So then, you, once you do that and compare that with the hard coded thing of del square and get the same result, 
there is no problem with the curl and curl curl is just the curl operating twice so probably that is also right then the grad div operator is probably also right mm. so that makes a set simple and yeah also you can maybe I have never tried it but you can put select a certain initial condition calculate the divergence of it output it and you can of course choose a divergence free field as your initial condition and check it is indeed zero or close to zero in the machine way. So we did the test with del square, we did the test with curl curl and grad d. So I hope it is not so bad. Okay. And another thing that we have not done yet is to implement a completely general routine uh, that then of course has all the 27 connection symbols plus all its uh, derivatives which means 27 times 3, right? Yes. And but most so, of them are zero. Yeah, yeah. So, but we, we, we have an automatic procedure which codes all the, this big huge matrix, matrix multiplies uh, everything within a loop correctly, and will be much slower, of course, but should give exactly the same result. Ah, <coughs> as a secondary test. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, that should be, uh, there's very little chance of error then, of course, because it's a completely general routine. Mm -hmm. Which you can use for all kinds of uh, black hole calculations, all of course. Yes. Still black hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's a five four. It's a five four. So, but, uh, the beauty of the whole thing is that you can basically adapt it to any coordinate system in there. Goes very well. Okay, so there are some little modifications which are also needed. For example, uh, a typical boundary condition where you would have ordinarily have in the Cartesian system just the derivative of a variable to be zero. Now often you will have an expression like this to be zero. So that will mean something like this. So instead of set, setting the anti-symmetric condition to set something to zero, you may need the slope condition, the slope uh, boundary condition with unit slope to set this thing to zero. So just you need to be aware of such stuff. Uh, the other thing is the way the CFL time step is estimated. Now there, if you, there also you have to include just the light like scaling factors. For example, the one over r <coughs> and the one over r sine theta here. That's about most of it. And then when you calculate the averages, you need to remember the volume element. So for that, you have to again go to sub, and there are these averaging subroutines. So then you multiply it by r squared sine squared theta, and that's fine. So uh, those things have they been implemented in the circle, in the cylindrical version? Because um, I mean I know, I know that uh, no, I haven't done that. No, yeah. I mean when we, when we worked on the circle stuff, uh, we did not explicitly take care of cylindrical all the time. But one way to just track this would be just track L spherical and see whether everywhere there is a corresponding L cylindrical. So in that sense, the code is uh, not really proof right, of course. And there are only 81 pieces. Okay. So for example, the time step may be too short, and the averages may not be the right ones. That's uh, so I haven't almost five right. And averages. Yeah, yeah. And so you're not affected directly. You didn't you plot something like RMS velocity or... No, not, not, not a big magnetic field, nothing. That's an advantage of minimum and maximum at any time. <laughs> Excellent. So a bit about performances. Um, so from if you just take the same, everything same, just go from Cartesian to spherical coordinate system, there are just some more operators to evaluate. And the code is roughly 1.5 times slower. So um, maybe slightly more faster. I'm not sure why it is 1.5 times. Because firstly, initially I thought there are a lot more terms. But then most of the terms are being calculated anyway. You just have to add them in the right way. So I don't know. But okay, okay maybe it's right. Uh, and I expect that in a cylindrical coordinate system, it will be somewhere in the middle. So it should be faster than the spherical and slower than the Cartesian. OK, so now that the code is ready, we are going to look at a simple example, uh, which is the helical MHD turbulence. Um, so the physical example we are going to look at is that uh, so in the spherical domain there is a perfect conductor boundary condition versus open vertical field which is the radial field now boundary condition and uh, the results are very similar the results we have 
in the spherical coordinate system are very similar to one that had been earlier obtained by Ulfgang and Axel in Cartesian coordinate system. So this line is the inert, the kinetic energy, and this is the dynamo building up, and that's the magnetic energy. And the left one is for the open vertical field. And it goes up and saturates somewhere roughly at the same value as the RMA. So you can, it's this saturation. Whereas the other one keeps increasing. The rest of the plot is not here. I, I mean, this, this plot is roughly seven days older. It grew and saturated roughly 10 times the value. So you have a super saturation here and a saturation in this case. So as all talks these days must have beautiful pictures. Here are some pictures. So this is a plot of the magnetic vector potential in the meridional plane for one five. Um, nothing very special. Uh, the nicer things are in plot of the magnetic field. So this here you can see the large scale magnetic fields are actually building up. This is still far from saturation. Um, yes. So this is Br, B theta, and B five. So now we have to look at a bit of limitations. The first one is not so serious. The second one is a real serious limitation. We cannot include the axis due to two different reasons. One is the axis is a numerical singularity because 1 over r becomes, of course, infinite. Um, that can be avoided. There are ways to work around that. You can shift your grids by half spacing so that you are not at the axis but half before and half later and use derivatives such that they go across the axis in the right direction. But the trouble is that you are, for example, when you are going close to the axis where z equal to 0, your r sin theta will become very small. So the grid spacing in the innermost circle will be, if you are using say 500 cube, will be 500 times smaller than your other grid spacing. So that will affect your CFL time step and it will be roughly 500 times smaller. So and if then if you are including viscosity is 500 square, so then you are dead. So that's the more difficult problem, and I don't think we have any way to avoid that. Um, the other problem is that implementing helical forcing in a spherical polar coordinate system it involves um, calculation of spherical Bessel functions and spherical harmonics. Things I have been doing with GSL, and uh, Wolfgang is not very happy about it. Um, but then later I checked that if I just use the Cartesian helical forcing as it is, it works perfectly well. So that's about it. Thank you. Thanks for what so interesting work. I think um, it would be two hundred. So any, any questions? Any discussion? Is there any, uh, nothing is written of this stuff in, in the grid file, and uh, is something written out to the to the um, to the disk so that you can use it to the informations in, in IDL? Mm. Or how much you, you have Actually, to write? Actually, there are IDL codes which use this to. For example, we output only the A, and then when I plot the B, I need to take a card of it. So there are, exist IDL codes which do that. Okay. And reads the, for example, the inverse after the start and R all. I have written something called R is pH, which is very simple. And then takes from there. So these are in the, in one of Excel's ideal directories in spherical geometry part. So you can just make it, bring it back to the main ideal part also. There, there exist ideal clothes which will allow you to do this. I have probably haven't even used myself. So what, uh, what I use for in advanced spelling the B field is to use the B field that is actually calculated in the code and uh, put this into the F array, which is another thing that uh, Tony and me developed some time ago, and a general tool to uh, allocate full 3D chunks on the run. <coughs> it's uh, relatively simple. And so you can do that. And uh, in that connection, we've done this another reason reason when we have included these F arrays is when we calculated time averages for any quantity, even secondary quantities. You have such a thing, a global time average once, but those were for 
the natural variables in the code. But if you have the B field, for example, if B does not exist as in, in the actual ordinary array. So you have to calculate B in the code yes. and then time average that. So such possibilities can be done with an additional chunk in the array and then can be output onto disk. And then average is objectively taken. Do, so I didn't know that. So that was that was what we were working show yesterday when there was this curious time integral in the uh, in the in the print file. Um, so here too one can calculate B and we do that. We can calculate B and we calculate J, the current density, and can put this output this in the wizard's array. And then you're sure you have exactly the same variable as in the code, except that it's one time step earlier than the rest of the area. That's an uh, unfortunate uh, side effect. But all our averages are one step step earlier. Yeah, uh, so but then we have to write, we know the time to which they belong to. Yes, the so it's array. better that when you write out the BRA calculations, RMS, and then compare it to the BRMS, you get, you get the same number. Yes. yes. Did you already uh, check convection so I can call you? No, we haven't, but the, all, all, the, all the operators are ready. So if you just turn on convection, it should work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a good way to, to check the onset of convection, mm -hmm. so I can uh, share, for example, to show... Uh, Even the critical relay numbers and things yeah, like, something that. like that. Yeah. But do we know such thing, for example, spherical domains? Very well. I mean, I know that they're yeah, very yes, well, uh, not uh, yeah. in the queer, but... I did that for in, in Cartesian box, uh, I already did that. And I did that, uh, I began to do that, uh, in Star in a Box simulation. But remember, these are not global, because we don't go to the pole. Yeah, but this pole maybe can, I, s I know that some guy, uh, like your, your method to, to shift a little bit yes. the grid, I think there is no... Then you still have to abandon the time step procedure, because the time step would be with this scheme too short. Sure, but so if you look at the pole, the for example, if you look at the domain from the top, mm. so you will have so these are circles which are say constant five, and then you will have things like that. Mm. So here is the axis. Mm. So what you, you can do is you can shift these things by half, no problem at all. But you see there are there will be lots of points here, and two grid points here will come very close. You can do interpolation. Sorry, you can. Takes an epsilon, and reduce epsilon, and find the interpolation. she says, but but it probably is a time step, simply. Ah, it, it decreases anyway. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this it is a square of the, of the distance. The uh, one way could be if we could use less number of grid points as we go inside, but that's. But yeah, but we can we can check with a low resolution. Yes, that's yeah, because the onset of convection can be uh, uh, tackled with a very few points, in fact. Huh? I don't know, because there is another thing that I noticed, which is the following. For example, if you want to calculate the average value of a particular quantity, and in a box which is slightly spherical, not very far from spherical, if you don't have enough resolution, you will just get a wrong value. Because you are not just, you, for example, you should just get the volume of the box, if the value is just constant. But you won't get it very close to the volume if you're if you are not sampling the volume enough. Okay, so you can we can check first in two D in a in an equatorial plane. Yes, that's uh, like no problem in this case. Okay. Just in an equatorial plane, and we just take a sub supercritical really number. We compute uh, the growth rate. Okay, that that can be Yeah. At least in 2D. Mm, I think it can be done. Because uh, in the 2D code I use, the longer I see, it takes much more room. So that, uh, it's uh, less well defined, more obliged, because I uh, have uh, an instability or a strong increase of the. Uh, in the 2D code? I have a 2D evolutionary code. Yes, so but they don't have an axis problem. Do you include the center? No, no. I, my star is axis symmetric. So mm -hmm. I do a very general thing. And around the axis, I have a problem that uh, we calculate the Jacobians. And if the, the zoning is too small, uh, we have singularity occurring in the calculation of the Jacobian. It is divided by something going to zero. So we are obliged to keep 
uh, not to be too refined to use these axes to prevent uh, the, the appearance of the black So you take non-uniform grid? Uh, in fact, uh, we are not uh, too much discretized uh, in collective. Okay. We privilegiate uh, this, uh, mm -hmm. radial discretization instead of the mm -hmm. collective. Yes, another thing that maybe you can do for testing is it's a test using a bubble in, a, in, a, in 2D, in a, in a quarter of band scale. You put some entropy bubble in a uh, isothermal atmosphere, and you and you compute uh, the the actin, the eigen mode, and you show and you you, you see if the eigen mode, uh, which propagates in your simulation in the equatorial plane, uh, have the same value as the, the theoretical one. So, so do you know the theoretical value in the equatorial yeah, plane? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's uh, analytical, an isothermal atmosphere with a constant gravity field. In an equatorial plane, you know the theoretical eigenvalue and eigenvector. So you, the setup is simply an isothermal atmosphere, and uh, you put a, a, an entropy bubble somewhere in the domain. The bubble will oscillate, generate modes, and then you can uh, you can compare the spectrum with the theoretical one. I was just wondering that if we come to the equatorial plane. We may actually not be testing it by not part of the code. Yeah, but uh, but I think I think you can then do the same thing for a meridional plane and see whether you get the same result, for example. But I don't have the axis in the meridional. No, but it can be in any. Of course, if it's it shouldn't matter. The axis is not a distinguished point anymore because there's no rotation, and so it can be at any latitude. Yeah. No, but you won't have the full circle. Yeah, but it's a localized phenomenon anyway. <coughs> so as long as the uh, effect of the bubble doesn't approach the boundary, you're fine. Any more questions? Thank you for the